So let's start with Tobias and let's talk about uh, airway management. Thank you, Tobias. So, hello, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a really great honor. And first of all, I would like to say, to mention all the colleagues that worked on the guidelines. So we are the trees that hide the forest of the intense work that has been done by, by many colleagues working on the, on the guideline. So um, I would like to first start to talk about the, um, the concept of inline stabilization, and um, which can be a major challenge in the, in the management of intubation in the pre-hospital arena. So this is why we felt that in the guidelines it was important to insist on the to insist on the on the importance of the we can go back with this one with this one no this one to go forward yes okay we'll manage um, to insist on the importance of inline stabilization um, as it can be a challenge for the intubation procedure in the pre-hospital arena. And as you can see on this picture, which I find very, very compelling, this is a picture from the Sydney Hammers team. Uh, well, probably it's better this way. This is a picture from the Sydney Hammers team. So the Sydney Hammers team is a really expert pre-hospital uh, team, um, very specialized in trauma. And you can see on the picture, the intubation of a patient with a suspected spine injury becomes a ballet of hands. You can see there are four operators that are actually necessary to perform a safe pre-hospital intubation to, um, to perform at the same time the inline stabilization. So there's one operator, is the lady in the back. There's one operator in the front with the helmet who performs the salic maneuver. And you have the operator that is actually on the intubation performing the laryngoscopy and, uh, and an assistant or colleague who performs, who will help uh, to guide this probe over the bougie. So this picture really perfectly sums up the key messages that we wanted to convey in the guidelines, meaning that um, there's a balance between the necessity to maintain inline stabilization in your patients in the pre-hospital arena because although, of course, the evidence is mainly observational and based on cadaver studies or patients for uh, controlled surgery in theater, um, and uh, in accordance with many other guidelines, like the recent Norwegian guideline, the UK or the US guideline, maintaining inline stabilization is really crucial, and there's compelling or sufficient evidence in literature to say you have to maintain inline stabilization. But we all know from practice and from everyday life that the inline stabilization can really be an obstacle to obtain good intubation conditions. So um, once there are simple things that you can that you should respect to or that you should can you put in place to make sure that the that the objectives between inline stabilization and good conditions for intubation um, don't conflict. So and this is why this picture sums this up so nicely. Inline stabilization by one operator. No, you can see that they t took away the neck brace, because the neck brace very often will hinder good exposition. If the neck brace is already in place, you can open it. You can open the front part. The patient is nicely positioned in terms of his, of his head, so there's a sniffing position. Um, and so they have a good balance between inline stabilization and good exposure for the intubation. The second key message that we wanted to convey with the guidelines that you can see from the picture is that um, they use traditional laryngoscopy. So we have currently, there's, um, there are not many randomized control trials. There are not many randomized control trials. That's actually the next one. That's the last message. Thank you, Pierre. There are not many randomized control trials actually to look at the use of video laryngoscopy in the pre-hospital arena. <coughs> There's one study from 2011 from Austria um, that could show no benefit of the use of video laryngoscopy in the pre-hospital setting. Um, these were mainly, this was the air track mainly, and it was mainly um, very experienced uh, anesthetists. 
because uh, many anesthetists are standardly on the HEMS teams in Austria and Germany. Um, and they couldn't find a benefit of the use of viroscopy for intubation in the pre-hospital setting. There's another study from Korea that could find a benefit that uh, came out recently, but overall, there's no compelling evidence to say in the pre-hospital arena we should standardly use video laryngoscopy as due to many very pragmatic facts, like for example, um, the impairing of the visibility um, on the, of, the, uh, of the camera. The camera gets impaired by blood, by secretions, um, and, and there's, of course, there's a technicity, so it need to be, it's obvious that the experience with the device is very, very important. That's the second message. So virioangoscopy should not be used as a routine device, and you should stay with, your, with what you know best, and this turns out to be, obviously, the standard laryngoscope. The third message is important on the picture, and maybe a change of, of dogma, especially um, for us in, in the French setting, um, but it's standard use already actually in many countries, um, especially in the UK and the US, is the standard use of a bougie on the first attempt. We tend to use the bougie uh, when we have difficulty, um, and actually uh, in these countries, the use is of standard bougie for your first attempt. And there's an interesting study that we could not include in the in the uh, in the uh, guidelines, <coughs> it's from the U.S. Uh, came out in JAMA last year, 2011. It's from a single center in Minnesota. Um, it's a it's a general hospital, district hospital, the setting, uh, and it's emergency department. So the intubation is performed by emergency physicians. And as you can see on the upper curve, there is a, there was a very very uh, surprising, or well, not surprising actually, but a very compelling evidence in this work in favor of the standard use of the bougie, the first attempt, and they have a much higher rate of first pass success of more than um, of 96% compared to 82% for the standard laryngoscopy. And you can see that not only was the first attempt more successful uh, much more often, but also the, uh, the, they were much faster at intubating. The same rate of complications. So there's a caveat, of course, and the transposition of this result to the pre-hospital setting is that A, as I said, this is in the emergency department, uh, so it's not pre-hospital, but it's intubation for any kind of condition, so not only trauma. And the second caveat is that it's um, performed with a CMAC, so it's actually a system of video laryngoscopy. Nevertheless, this study uh, and another meta-analysis uh, about the bougie actually tend to show that the use, the standard use of the bougie on the first attempt might be really a very interesting uh, new attitude to think that we should think about and adopt into our practices. And that's why we thought it was important to talk about it in the guidelines. Um, so when we sum up the guidelines, the, the key messages, as you can see on this diagram, so um, in the pre-hospital setting, um, induction for rapid sequence, standard direct laryngoscopy, um, tend to use the, uh, the bougie um, systematically. Um, take time to prepare for the intubation so that you have really good intubation conditions, uh, especially with regard to the inline stabilization, the position of the head, and then intra-hospitally, uh, um, what we could now develop in our discussion, Pierre, but I wanted to really insist on the key messages on the pre-hospital setting. Um, either you have the emergency, so then you should revert to video angoscopy as a standard uh, procedure, or no emergency and no full stomach, then you should use probably the fiber optic intubation. But I suggest that we can develop this in our discussion. Thank you. <coughs> okay, thank you, Tobias. So uh, there is no question right now online, but we. My first question is: You need all these people to make the immobilization procedure during the pre-hospital phase. Can you do it with less people? Uh, I saw on the picture there is always four people. I would say around the patient. 
can you reduce the number? How can you do the best immobilization technique? Is only two persons at the edge is okay? How, how would you do in clinical practice if there is a, not a, a lot of people around the patient? That is a very good question because, um, as I said, it's a, when you can go back to the picture. You want to go back to the picture? Yes, please. If we could go back to the picture. I'm not sure we can. Um, as you can see, it, it's really a, a ballet. Mm. And, uh, of course, there's been no study done on how many, what is the minimal number. But if you maintain the Selig maneuver, um, then you need at least four people. Um, of course, we could now discuss, talk about the Selig maneuver. Is it really necessary to maintain it? Uh, there's, the, there's the study from uh, La Pitié, uh, from, um, coordinated by Bruno Rioux, that could actually, that tends to show that probably we could abandon the Selig maneuver rather safely. That's my take from the study. Um, and it's again interesting how different attitudes can be from country to country. In the UK and the US, all the HEMS teams have abandoned the SELIC maneuver, yeah. okay? So the intubation becomes then a three-man procedure. That said, as you can see on the picture, um, it's still a three-man maneuver because the systematic use of the bougie uh, turns the intubation into a two-man procedure, okay? Because you have somebody to control the bougie. But um, having worked in the UK recently for two years, um, I really remember very well my first training for HEMS in the simulation, we had a whole simulation week where we simulated eight hours a day. So to get uh, familiar with the, with the standard protocol of the HEMS service. By the way, one of the most frustrating experiences in my life because you had to change completely your software. I had to change completely my German-French software and, and load the UK software. And I remember really well uh, my first scenario where I had to intubate and I started to intubate the way I would have done in France, and they, they rolled their eyes, okay, because I left the bougie by the side, and uh, so, and I had to admit, I have to admit, that during my time in the UK, I really, really uh, started to appreciate the systematic use of the bougie for emergency intubation. But then, intubation becomes a two-man procedure, or two, two people procedure. And going back to the Selic maneuver, uh, is there a risk if you have a spinal cord injury, that you move the vertebra and increase the neurologic dysfunction afterwards. Is this a risky uh, maneuver uh, when you have a spinal cord injury? So um, the cadaver studies show actually that the manipulation that we perform during intubation, including the position of the head, um, to, to create a cervical spine injury, a major cervical spine injury, you need a tremendous transfer of kinetic energy. So um, the man manipulations that we perform actually when we position the patient or when we perform the static maneuver is, is really minimal compared to the transfer of kinetic energy that happens while the trauma is actually is, 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 is created by the, by, the, by the accident. So um, again, it's with the limitation of cadaver studies, but actually most of them show that it's actually all the manipulations we perform, unless they're extreme, of course, actually quite safe. Sometimes they can even reduce the fracture, okay? Mm -hmm. So the SELIC maneuver should, when you perform it safely, according to the guidelines, it should not actually, um, it should not actually increase okay. the injury. But if you don't have any benefit of the maneuver, because as you, as you said, there is a one randomized clinical trial showing not really good benefit of the maneuver, and probably you decrease your condition of intubation. I don't see the point to to still use it. <laughs> no. Yeah, I, we I have. Agree. We should have a clear message for the the audience. So Absolutely. we have to choose whether we do the maneuver or not. And what is your opinion of the other people around the table? Maybe would you use? A we don't maneuver? choose it. Okay. Anymore. So we seeing the the studies hmm. showing no benefit. So and rendering the intubation more difficult, we don't use okay. uh, maneuver, this maneuver again. Again, from my experience from, from other countries um, and having intubated there many times I, and having abandoned the static maneuver, I, I really, I think we can say that it's safe to 
not perform it. Okay. And it's, I think it's, it's more, you have more, and that's what the study actually showed, is that the static maneuver very often deteriorates your intubation condition. Yes. So that's probably more harmful than the benefit yeah. it may convey. Yeah. Thomas, you want to add something? Yeah. Thank you, Tobias. I have a question for you. Uh, I understand that the standard laryngoscope is the first option, but as you said, in these conditions, probably video laryngoscopy may be difficult. So what is your plan B? in case of failure with a standard laryngoscope? Um, as um, several studies have actually shown, when you, when you read the small prints in the studies about pre-hospital intubation, and that's actually a point that is very often not, um, not really detailed in the studies, is are the pre-intubation conditions, is that how did they position the patient? Was he really in the sniffing position? Did they ramp the patient, et cetera, et cetera? Of course, these can be things that can be challenging in the pre-hospital setting or challenging in any patient with spinal injury. But um, I think this is, the key. this is the key to your intubation success, actually, is to take the time to create the best conditions that you can create, of course, within the given time that you have. Um, and, and that's what actually the studies from London Hammers or Sydney Hams show, because they have very, maybe some people would say, too rigid, too psycho-rigid structures to put in place to make sure that this preparation phase is really crucial for your intubation success. Thank, thank you, Tobias. So it's not uh, so easy to be in good conditions to place the patients under mechanical ventilations. Uh, if it's always necessary to place the tubes uh, outside of the hospital, is it better to wait for the patient to be inside the hospital with all the device and all the people around? Um, that's a very good question. And, and uh, I totally agree that it's, uh, it's every time an individual risk benefit analysis. Um, you should not take the intubation, any pre-hospital intubation lightly. And the study shows there is a high risk of adverse events. And in these very fragile patients that may have other traumas, associated traumas, brain injury, may be in shock. So any additional insult that we take lightly, like post-intubation hypotension, hypoxia, hypercarbia, this is all adding insult to injury. So um, there's an individual risk benefit, um, and it depends on many things, on your the transport time, transport condition, your access to the patient during the transport, um, your capacities, okay, how safe, how, how confident you feel to be able to intubate this patient at this very moment, um, and, the, and, the, and the consequences of the intubation in terms of hypotension. So definitely, some patients require intubation on scene. They have associated trauma, chest trauma. They have already respiratory deficiency because of the impairment by the spinal cord injury. So of course, these patients, they definitely need intubation, but um, it's an individual risk benefit analysis. Okay, thank you, thank you, Tobias, uh, very good talk.